lived here for uh, two years now. And prior to that, I was with the University of Canterbury, um, completing my Master of Audiology degree. Um, so for anyone who's interested in health and technology and are looking for a different career path, um, I can guarantee that audiology is quite exciting and well worth um, your time and investment. Uh, just coming back to one of the jokes earlier, um, often when I tell people when I'm an audiologist, they go, what was that? Oh. Typical joke, I'm not quite sure if they don't actually know what it means or whether or not they just didn't hear me or it's a joke. Um, but yes, I mainly deal with um, hearing and treating hearing loss. I'll just on to the next slide. Thank you. Um, so I'd just like to begin by saying that there is so much more to hearing and hearing loss than what I'm going to be talking about today. This is just really a snapshot into what we do and also the technology that's available to help people. Um, by no means is this exhaustive. Um, but just I guess from a take home message, um, if I ramble on too much and you fall asleep by the time this is over, I guess what I'd like to put across to you um, today is that our hearing is essential to participation and conversation, um, watching television and listening to music and sometimes we take that for granted. Uh, we also rely on our hearing to maximise the use of devices such as cell phones, MP3 players and maybe even Skyping um, family members or friends. So often these social experiences can be difficult for people with hearing loss. Um, my last client, case in point, refuses to answer the phone because she can't hear. So technology um, actually provides an opportunity for um, those with hearing loss to reconnect to the world, pretty much. So now I'm just going to show you a clip, um, and this will just give you an idea of how the hearing system works, um, because we don't really know about how the ear functions. The ear has three oh. parts, the outer ear, or auricle, the middle... Okay, so... Um, as you heard, yep, this is the outer ear, so we're quite familiar with this. Um, sound waves are directed down the ear, down the ear canal, and funnel down to the eardrum, also known as the tympanic membrane. Uh, once those ear waves hit the eardrum, you can see a small, let's go past this part here, great. Um, once the sound waves hit the eardrum, they get transferred through the tiniest bones in our body, and that's these three bones here. And those bones are the malleus, Anchors and stapes, come through soon. Um, they then send pressure waves through the fluids that are in our hearing organ, and that's this blue snail like structure here. So, in that tiny little um, snail like structure, which is probably no bigger than the size of your thumb nail, um, that will then analyze what pitch you hear, how loud you hear a sound, and convert that energy into an electrical impulse that will then send the signal, as you've seen here, along the hearing nerve to the brain. And then we might just, it might just come back out and we'll just get a larger view of what goes on there. So pretty intricate system. Often people think it's just the eardrum and that's it, but there's so much more to your hearing. And then obviously your brain has to recognise that it's receiving input from um, external sound waves. And we'll just stop here. Okay, so that's how we hear. And just in the next one. Uh, actually, that was just a still image um, if we couldn't... Okay, so this is the audiogram, and this is a tool that we use um, as audiologists to measure how well a person is hearing sounds that are really important, um, especially for speech understanding. Um, typically for adults, what we do is that we would place an earplug into each ear, we'll give them a button, and we'll say, okay, every time you hear a beat, press it. Um, and then we measure how soft um, they can hear each of the sounds. So um, the aim really is to measure yeah, the quietest sounds that they can hear. So looking at this picture here, you see, we've got across the top of the graph, we've got um, frequency or pitch, so we've got bass tones here, here and then we've got high pitched uh, tones. Oh, is it? Sorry. <laughs> I was thinking, why is that coming up now? Actually, oh, that's good. Can I go back a step? Sorry. And maybe one more. Oh, just back forward. Sorry. Sorry about that. 
okay, so I won't touch it. Um, so we've got bass tones at this end of the scale and then um, treble or high frequency tones at this end. Then down the bottom we've got loudness. Um, so ideally when people press the button and when they hear a beep, their um, responses should occur around the zero decibel line. I think I can press that. Um, so where the arrow is, uh, yeah, so if they're around zero, then it represents zero hearing loss. The further down the page they go with those responses, um, say down to moderate, then they have a, a hearing loss, and we've got a different scale here. Another important thing to notice about this graph um, is that you can see where different alphabetical letters um, are found, or speech sounds. So for anyone who has a, say, a hearing loss around the moderate range, then they really don't hear these speech sounds that well. It kind of sounds like someone's talking with their hand over their mouth like this. So, um, yeah, that's how that works. Uh, okay. Yes, and often too, um, people who I see will present with hearing loss at around that moderate level. Um, and in terms of um, statistics, <laughs> no. I'm obviously not very good at technology. Um, okay, so in terms of stats, um, I believe these stats come from data um, from census right up to about 2001, 2002. And um, they pose the questions, um, so that can influence the numbers that come out at the end. I think the questions were, can you hear three people talking with you? Can you hear one person? So overall, the general population of people who are 15 years of age and over, about 10% of people suffer a hearing loss. So that's quite a bit. If you're looking at, say, 4 million, that's about 400,000 people, although that's over the age of 15. Um, people who can't hear the person talking next to them would probably call them profoundly deaf. 0.05% um, um, of those people over, of the population over 15 years of age can't hear the person talking next to them. So it's, that's a few. Uh, in terms, if we split that down a little bit, if we look at the Maori population, um, overall Maori are faring better than the general population. They do think, though, that could be related to um, life expectancy as well. Um, but the age group 15 to 24 is about three times higher than non maori so there's quite a few young adults in that group with hearing loss. And then um, 65 plus age group is about the same as non maori um, Certainly there's a trend that as we get older, our hearing gets worse. And it's about 22.1% of adults aged 65 years and over who um, have a hearing loss. And that probably only re represents people who are in their own homes living independently, they're not institutionalised. And that uh, figure of about 22 to 25% is very similar uh, in other large countries like the US and Australia and the UK. Okay, so that's the stats. Um, so I'll skip around a bit here. Can you, can you see if, when you tap that, whether that works? Oh, okay. Yep. Okay, so um, there are different types of hearing loss. So I'm going to talk mainly about permanent hearing loss because that's kind of when I come involved in terms of rehabilitation. Um, so as you saw from the video clip before, so we've got the sound waves coming through the ear canal and then vibrating through the eardrum here. And normally at stage one and stage two, they're what we call conductive hearing losses, and often they can be medically treated or treated with um, surgery. Sometimes, however, um, I still see those people, but more often than not, I'm looking um, or helping people with what we call a sensory neural hearing loss. So those people have a problem not only with their hearing organs, sorry, put that back in. Let's go back. Nearly. Can I go? Can I get there? Nearly got it. <laughs> uh, sorry, uh, the hearing organ or the hearing nerve, so those are the people that I'm often treating in our clinic. Okay, so, 
So in terms of um, hearing loss uh, and in terms of options for rehabilitation, what can those people do? Oh, technology, I'll do it. It's easy. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so hearing loss and treatment options. So um, first of all, um, people can look at um, counselling or hearing therapy services. Um, they might not be visiting John Kerwin, um, but they can seek counselling. And it's more about looking at effective ways to communicate with other people around them, um, like looking face to face, reading, lip reading, things like that. Of course, there are hearing aids. Um, so um, hearing aids are an option for people. Apart from that, we also have assistive listening devices. Um, don't quite look like this. <laughs> um, but assistive listening devices might be something, say you have a headset or wireless headset that you can listen to the TV on. Um, of course, people don't have to do anything. They can always defer their treatments. So, um, often though, hearing loss also has negative consequences for, or if it's untreated, um, and in terms of the personal and emotive side, one will be talking about that more later. And I'll be talking largely about hearing aids. Um, so yeah, that's what we're looking at. Right, so hearing aids in the past. Um, while I was at university, I lived with my partner's, well, my partner and I, we live with his mother who is quite deaf in one ear and is not so great, her other ear is not so great either. Um, there's a hereditary component there, but she used to tell me about her, her grandmother, who had one of these acoustic horns that you can see in the top right hand picture. And her and her um, cousins and family members would love going into, I don't know, rile up the grandmother by yelling into the acoustic horn and giving her a, a fright. So, hasn't not that long ago that that was probably the only option for people with a hearing loss. Um, more recently though, in, in modern times, we've got the hearing aids, which is a picture here down the bo bottom. Um, up until the end of the 90s, hearing aids were largely what we call an analogue hearing aid, so um, just more of a microphone and radio transistor to an, an amplifier to turn everything up. Um, they had some but very limited programming options um, in terms of how we could tune them for people. That was quite limited as well. And as you can see, not the most attractive thing to wear. And I still have people today saying to me, oh, does it have to be a big bulky thing that my dad wore? Um, so they were large and bulky. Let's move on to the next one. Um, since 2000 though, all hearing aids, um, probably in New Zealand, I'm not sure about elsewhere, but they're, they're largely digital hearing aids now, so um, we can take advantage of that technology and really what's, what that has meant for people is that we can provide listeners with multiple programs, so maybe in a quiet room we can have the hearing aid set that, so that it picks up everything around them. And then in a noisy environment, um, we can narrow down that focus from a panoramic view to a more fixed directional focus. It's also meant too that with multi-channel and multi-bands, the signal going into the hearing aid gets split up, gets processed on, and allows us to fine tune the hearing aid better for the individual. So that just helps to improve the sound quality and to try and provide as natural hearing as we possibly can. Um, I'll point this out again later, but hearing aids don't give you back normal hearing, um, unfortunately, but we do try as, as best we can to, to reach that target. <coughs> um, also with digital hearing aids, um, we were able to incorporate wide dynamic range compression. And that just really means that for those quiet speech sounds that people don't hear very well, we can just raise those up so that people can hear them better without turning up sounds like the train going by, because people with hearing loss can probably hear a train going by. They don't need that amplified. Um, directional microphones as well, just again changing from that panoramic view to a focused view. And that really helps, um, along with the digital noise reduction, to improve people's listening in, in difficult listening environments like um, in, a, in a restaurant. It's always pretty tricky anyway, but that's the idea. 
problem with old hearing aids is that when they put them in the ears, they whistle like mad, and people get angry with them. Um, today, there's a few, still a few exceptions there, but mostly now um, with digital technology, we can actually reduce that whistling in the hearing aid to quite a large degree, which is really good. It just means that when people go out the door from seeing me, they're very happy, and that's what I what I like. Um, obviously from the picture too, they're a bit smaller now, or they can be, compared to the older style hearing aids. Um, there's still a few larger ones out there, and that would probably indicate that someone has quite a degree of hearing loss, um, but they have certainly improved in their size. And again, yeah, the hearing aid is not as good as a normal functioning ear or brain. Um, <coughs> Okay, so coming on to wireless connectivity. Oops, I forgot my picture. <laughs> um, so hearing aids are now, uh, well, some of them are now um, capable of sending information to each other. Uh, in the past, they have had the ability to connect to other wireless communications, um, especially um, school children have, have had a huge advantage where the teacher might be wearing a microphone and the signal coming, leaving the microphone will go directly to the child's hearing aid and they can hear the teacher directly as though they were standing next to them in the ear. So that kind of wireless connectivity has been around for a while, but it's advanced more that now hearing aids are communicating with each other um, so that if someone presses a volume control or a program button on one side of the uh, head or on the hearing aid, that information will actually be transferred to the other hearing aid as well, and that hearing aid will um, do the same uh, function. Uh, it also means that the hearing aids now will analyse the information coming in and com again communicate that to each other to try to give the listener with the hearing aids an advantage, especially when there's background noise. So a lot more sophisticated than um, the previous hearing aids. And it means too that with that, the hearing aid can be more automatic for the user. So often the clients that I see will be over, probably over 60 years of age for the most part. Many of them have arthritic fingers. They can't press little buttons or manipulate tiny controls. So, um, and for me personally and professionally, if I had a hearing aid, I'd rather just pop it on my ear and let it do the work. I don't want to be fiddling around with it and neither do my clients. So um, yeah, the wireless functions have certainly helped for sure. Um, and uh, yeah, quite a bit more with wireless. Um, I'm not sure if we can all afford the $30,000 gold hearing aid and remote control that comes with it. Um, but kind of a nice idea, but it gives you an idea that yeah, with that wireless connectivity, um, people who traditionally like to have volume controls um, might wish to have a remote that they can control that on. Um, so there's that wireless <coughs> option there. Uh, the remote microphone again refers to perhaps someone wearing a lapel mic and that information streaming from their voice goes through the microphone and straight to the hearing aids. And that's uh, quite an advantage if you're in a really noisy environment. Uh, television adapters as well, so people can plug an adapter into their television, they can kind of sit back and uh, just listen to the TV information streaming through their ears. Uh, likewise with the cell phones too, you can actually talk hands-free. So essentially if you had normal hearing, you could get yourself a pair of hearing aids and you can listen hands-free hands through your... Um, hands three on your cell phone through your hearing aids. Um, so similar with MP3, iPods, tablets and PCs. So just having that connection there um, for people um, is pretty great. Um, often, oh, sorry, <laughs> oh, we can stay there. Um, yeah, often with those extra devices, um, probably with my generation coming through, we're very tech savvy. We like those things. Um, at the moment, with some of our older clients, they just like to keep things nice and simple. Um, but yeah, as, as the years go on, we'll probably see people wanting more and more of these um, connections. Okay, so 
Um, I think we might be. Uh, I think we might be on one more to oh, okay. <coughs> yeah, yep. So, oh, I guess we can go back one. So, <laughs> we can go back right that way, <laughs> and then forward one more. Yeah, so apps are all the rage. Um, let me just see. So now if I was wearing hearing aids, um, I could actually control them using my iPhone, um, using an app that the manufacturer would have supplied. Um, at the moment, those apps are free. So in this particular case, um, the individual will be wearing the hearing aid. There is a stream, however, that they must have at the moment because the hearing aids don't have Bluetooth inside them. So the streamer will communicate um, to the hearing aid and, it's, and the um, iPhone app will communicate to the streamer. At some stage in the future, however, they're hoping to do away with that interface and that, yes, you will be able to connect directly to your iPhone um, with the hearing aid. So we'll be waiting for that one. Okay. And <laughs> I was trying to be smart with that one. <laughs> um, and I guess, yeah, from my point of view, there are a number of well-reputed hearing aid manufacturers who do a lot of research and design. There are great engineers who put these products together. But because there are different brands, they all have their different programming cables, there are a number of different models, there are a lot of wires. Sometimes I might end up like the top picture. Um, there have been a few occasions where wires get me, um, mixed up. Um, but nowadays, on this picture here, it's not quite visible, but now we have a wireless USB connection that we can just link straight to the hearing aids and program them. It's just so much more hassle-free. So from our point of view, this wireless connectivity is great. Okay, and the next one. <laughs> so uh, we talked a little bit about mild and moderate hearing loss um, before, but now we'll just look at mild hearing loss because I think that's going to be something that we, uh, as a profession, really focusing on uh, for the future due to the research that's coming out. Um, so with mild hearing losses, people will often say, actually I'm fine, I only have difficulty in background noise, um, I don't really perceive there to be a problem. And uh, often they can be marginal for treatment, um, if it's hearing aids or, or whatever. Um, but there's a lot of research coming out and it really started since the 70s um, that hearing loss could be causally related to dementia. Uh, including mild hearing losses. Um, and the older adults, probably looking at a 60 year plus group um, with mild hearing loss, have been shown to have decreased short term memory function. Um, there was one study that I read, um, I think comparing 65 year olds with a mild hearing loss to say 80 year olds with a mild hearing loss, they were very comparable on cognitive function tests. So um, yeah, while the individual might not perceive themselves to have much of a hearing loss, it could actually be causing problems in terms of their cognitive function. So in terms of what, um, what should those people do about it, if they have a permanent hearing loss, you're probably looking at hearing aids again. Um, and for those people with mild hearing loss, what we're seeing coming out from Australia, um, the National Acoustics Laboratory have a, a concept that they're putting through the development stage right now where they're developing super directional hearing aids and they have um, put it out there that they feel that once this technology is available that people with a mild hearing loss will have better hearing than someone with normal hearing. They also feel that someone with a moderate loss will have just as good a hearing as normal um, hearing listeners. So that's, again, from our perspective, quite exciting. Um, last time <coughs> we talked about the severe to profound hearing loss. Um, just where the arrow is down the profound range, hearing aids can, can be a good benefit, um, but more often, you know, people are really struggling 
with this, um, even with their hearing aids, they've got some sort of sound awareness. They really don't know what people are saying unless you're looking directly at them. Um, these people are, are struggling quite a bit. So hearing aids, um, once we've reached the profound stage, can be helpful but very limited in terms of benefit. So the technology available for people with a profound hearing loss um, is a cochlear implant. Um, it's a neural prosthesis and it delivers an electrical current to the hearing nerve so that it can stimulate the nerve and give your hearing brain an awareness that there's something going on. Now, you, you might have seen recently, um, probably in the last year or so, um, there's been a few clips on the news where there's a, a young child with the family. The child was born deaf, um, they attend a, a clinic session where they switch on the cochlear implant and suddenly he hears. Um, you might have seen it on the news, which is fantastic for those people. Um, kind of gives the perception that the t technology is really new. In actual fact, that technology has been around since the 1950s, so it's been out there for a while. Um, but in its infant stages, it really only provided people with an awareness that there was something going on. It really didn't give them any clarity or any meaning to sound at all. So it wasn't really until the 1980s um, where people started to improving, uh, or the, sorry, the devices advanced, and they um, were able to offer people speech perception. Um, and more recently, people with cochlear implants have been shown to perform just as well as people with normal hearing on speech understanding tasks. Still a little bit behind on hearing speech and noise and hearing um, or appreciating music. Music is, can be difficult for people with a cochlear implant, um, but those advances are moving forward. And also too recently, I just noticed on the um, Australian Cochlear website um, that they've now introduced um, or gone further with wireless connectivity as well. So they've introduced that to cochlear implants. Um, so just briefly on how it works. Um, this part here, the, the outer ear and the, the eardrum and the middle bones really play no part in this process. Um, we've got stage A, which is a little um, speech process and it has a microphone, so the signal, the external signal will go into the microphone. The speech signal, uh, speech processor, sorry, will um, divvy that up into an electrical signal. Um, that signal will be then sent through to stage B, which is an external transmitting device. And it also powers um, the internal device. So that information will be passed along to stage C, which is the Im implanted um, receiver. And they're often made of either, I think, titanium or ceramic. And then that information is passed down to an electrode which you can see here, which is kind of threaded in through the hearing organ of the cochlea, and that will stimulate the nerve. So um, that obviously requires surgery. Um, that's quite a, a big process, um, which Wanda will talk to you about, so I won't go on too much about that. Uh, she's got a great story. And we have a few um, clients in our clinic, and I think a few probably a few children in the community who have cochlear implants here in the Gisborne and East Coast region. Um, and that really concludes my, my talk. Um, as I say, it's very brief, it's very hard to cover hearing loss and the technology that we use in 15 minutes. <laughs> Um, but I'll, let, I'll hand you over to Wanda, and she has a, a more personal account about um, hearing loss and yeah, her experience going through hearing aids and cochlear implants. So, yeah, I'll pass you over. Thank you very much. Welcome. Wanda, your turn. Thank you. Hearing loss sounds like fun if you're into technology. <laughs> Thanks, Geraldine. Kia ora koutou. Um, ko Wanda tōku ingo. My name is Wanda, and... Um, I'm just going to give you a story about my journey from being fully hearing to hearing impaired to receiving a cochlear implant. Um, yeah, so it's, it's basically my pathway to wellness. Um, before hearing loss, um, life was really cool. Um, 
I, I had three children and I'd spent 10 years at home looking after them and they were just moving into teenagers and um, <clears throat> I could kind of see the light and I was going back to work and um, yeah, I was really confident about where I was going and I had good direction and then um, um, in January 1999 I was fitted with bilateral hearing aids and I was told I had a mild... Um, unexplained hearing loss, so basically there was absolutely no reason for me to have it, and um, I still don't really know why I got it. Um, and then by September 2006, um, I required the most powerful hearing aids um, that you could get at that stage. Yeah. Um, I changed from a confident, kind of short-haired, out there woman to someone who became really reclusive. I grew my hair because um, my ears were failing me. Um, I said no to anything that required listening, which was basically no to life. Um, for six years, I was in total denial of um, my need to address my hearing loss. And I really didn't know what to do about it. Um, my friends and Fano and teaching colleagues didn't have any idea what to do either. And I just, I suppose I just hid under a blanket for six years and cried, cried my life away because, um, yeah, I wasn't performing how I thought I should be. Yeah. Um, and then finally, I found a quiet cafe and I sat with a friend. And um, and that was a catalyst for change. Next one. Um, in April 2006, I went and saw a hearing therapist, and um, she told me that um, before she could deal with the remedies, I needed to go and see a counsellor about my loss and um, do some work about grief. And I'd never looked at it like that at all. I. All I saw it was hearing impairment, not hearing loss. And um, it was a real change for me. And um, yeah, I never kind of looked back from there. I just decided that, right, I needed to do something about that. So, um, yeah, the next one. Yep. Um, so, the first part of dealing with a hearing loss is actually um, admitting that you have a loss. And now with the support of audiologists, technology, um, my counsellor, friends, Fano, my teaching colleagues, um, I'm for, you know, striving to live life to the fullest. Um, yeah, it, it doesn't discriminate. It can be anybody. I know that, um, the statistics often say that it's the older people that can get it, but it can be generational and anybody can get it. Yeah. Um, the solutions don't just come, I mean the technology's there but you still have to take responsibility for um, creating a support network around yourself and you have to be proactive in seeking advice, it is there um, but you do need to work on making sure you make the most of it. Um, at this stage um, <clears throat> I still really missed things like hearing, hearing the rain, um, I really missed music. Um, and I really missed things like the spontaneity of being able to ring a friend and say, oh, let's go and have a coffee. Um, I couldn't use the telephone. Um, I couldn't pillow talk in the dark. <laughs> um, you know, I couldn't hear my footsteps. There's so many things that you just, you just miss out on when you, when you do have a, have a hearing loss. And, um, and what it does is you become very isolated and reclusive. And and that's a catalyst for loneliness. And, um, and it's just, you have this immense despair because you don't have the warmth in the, in the connection with, the, with human beings. Um, and I suppose something that um, really affected me was that there were personal relationships that were ruined, really, by total misunderstanding because, because we just there was just a communication block and um, yeah, I, I really struggled with that despite all the support network that I had around me. Um, the positive part of it was that I have an immense awareness and an unconditional acceptance of other people's disabilities. 
Um, I've formed some new relationships. Um, I've found out how um, what whānau love means. I've found out how deep friendships can be. Um, and every day I've been challenged to find new ways of doing things. Um, <clears throat> and people around me have had to make an effort to change their communication strategies so they can have that relationship with me. I've been incredibly fortunate to have teaching teams that have been sensitive and innovative in making sure I'm included in, in my workspace. Um, at this stage, before I had my cochlear implant, I um, didn't know how far my loss would progress. Um, and I knew that total deafness was in the future, but I also had come to the point where um, I knew that being deaf didn't mean that I was a lesser person, and um, yeah, I just, I just had to be kind to myself, basically. Yeah. Um, then in mid-July 2008, I had cochlear implant surgery. Okay. I was the first... Um, first government funded cochlear implantee for Tūrunganui Akiwa and it, when you um, receive government funding for a cochlear implant in Gisborne you do it down in Christchurch so um, I went down there and saw there were no dots on the map so I just planted a dot on there and said we're doing it. Um, yeah, it's real surgery, um, they do go into your skull and um, place the um, implant in there um, and you, you're still profoundly deaf so that was just one day after the um, surgery. Um, it takes six weeks for it to heal um, and next one, yeah and then six weeks after surgery as Geraldine kind of talked about a little bit you have what's called switch on and um, 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 yeah, and so yes, you have switch on. So the, basically, the pro the process is there, and you can, you can just kind of see the process there, and the, the information from the process that goes up into the coil and transmits it into your implant. Um, yeah, and so I was switched on, and then and then you connect it to a computer program. And that, that's all it is. It's just a machine and, and a computer program. Yeah. So that was about thirty seconds after I'd been switched on. Um, it was, it was quite computerised, like the audio audiologist was just talking to me and I was still lip reading at that stage and she was just saying, are you all right? And of course I was really all right because I could, I could hear even though it was, um, it, it was computerised, it was just like sound and I just kept thinking, actually I can cope with this for the rest of my life, it is much better than what I'd had before. Yeah. And then a few seconds later I realised I had clarity. And um, I, I realised that I was truly hearing and it wasn't lip reading. And um, I can still feel that, yeah. And then that's, that's like about a minute after I'd been switched on and I just kind of sat there and thought, whoa, I've got the beauty of sound. And um, yeah, it's just, it's really hard to explain, but um, you just don't know what you've been missing out on until you receive something like this. And, um, yeah. and then the next day I rang my sister <laughs> on the telephone. I hadn't used the phone for eight years, and um, that was my first conversation, and um, I think the face says it all, really. Yeah. It's a very individual journey and everybody is different. Um, that, that's just what happened for me. For some it, it takes a lot longer to get, get your hearing back. Um, yeah. But it's also about a team and my bravery wasn't just about me, it was about the immense courage that everybody around me had as well. Um, yeah. But in the end, the machine is the miracle. And I'd just like to read you something that I wrote. Um, it was on my birthday. It was a week after I had been switched on. My cochlear implant lives in a treasure box covered in stars that I've touched every day. This is only when my world is going to sleep and I've found out, that all, I, and I've found out all that I need to know for the day. In the morning, excitement, insight, excitement visits me as he understands the language of sound. He works at many jobs, bringing the song of the birds, the flight of a bumblebee, the tread of my footsteps, the voices of my loved ones, 
the roll of the waves, the scattering of pebbles, the creaking of the washing basket, the gentle sushing of the rain. He always moves around and sometimes when he dances with trust, there is lightning in the air. Pleasure is wild and sweet. I used to sleep early and do all my jobs to avoid her. Pleasure carries a purple bowl that is full of speech and sound. When it overflows, my children sing and dance. My husband wonders at the beauty of her and I wonder why I never saw her before. I wore loneliness around me like a grey blanket, and he nearly convinced me that relationships are so fragile that they may not survive. His best friend is despair, and together they broke my heart because there is no arguing with them. They even managed to stop me from listening to music. But courage looked me straight in the eye and transformed my fear into determination. When I was with courage, I was not afraid to weep or pray, even when I was not sure who I was praying to. I walked from lowliness to solitude because courage is also very kind and he helped to heal my heart. On my birthday, I had lots of visitors. I was living on a hill surrounded by beautiful roses. Clarity was my first guest. He told me to listen to the same thing every day until it started to speak to me. I heard trust every day after that. She was gracious, subtle and simple. I found out her mother is love. Confidence knocked on the door with doubt, but I told doubt I had too many house guests, so he left. Confidence only has one limitation, and that's his own. I now wrap myself around with the beauty of sound. She will dance with anyone who is brave enough to ask her. She's especially fond of people, and when they talk, she sends love letters to the stars. Harmony is one of my best friends now. He gives me space to be my whole self, and when I go to work, the sounds around him are lyrical. I have had a great desire to walk with joy, and at times I wondered if the effort to reach her was worth it. The distance seemed overwhelming. She was too spontaneous and faint. I could never quite hear her, but joy has chosen to walk with me. She is now my daughter, running barefoot, just to hear the wind and rustle of the grass underfoot. She plays the flute with her sisters and loves all kinds of sounds. Her laughter fills the sky. Kia ora koutou.